So I just want to go over what you guys should be looking out for today and tomorrow. And I want to start off by talking about a few things that I've seen out in the field and on some of my visits that I've been to this, the last month. So this farm, I went and visited and I, I seen some really interesting um, damage here. And, you know, when I see damage like this, where the, the leaves are growing in bunches, and you can see they're on the right, they're growing on bunches at the end of the branch. And then also in the other picture, all along the trunks and the limbs, um, it could be a number of things, but I think about maybe freeze damage because we know that somewhere in there, the vascular system has been damaged when we see this. So maybe freeze damage, maybe herbicide damage um, or a disease. And about the only disease um, that can cause issues like this is bunch disease. So we took samples from these trees and we, we took them to Sherry and we're awaiting the results on that. So um, whenever you guys see any trees that look like this, make sure you get some samples in to Sherry to have them tested because this disease can spread through the orchard quickly if the trees aren't cut out. And that is the only way to control for this disease. It's spread by um, leaf hoppers, and it is a phytoplasm, which um, plugs up all the vascular tissue um, of the plant. And we're not really sure that's what's going on here. Um, we're awaiting these results, um, but I'll keep you all updated on, on what we find out. And it is very suspicious for bunch disease. Um, zinc deficiency can also cause rosettes um, to form at the end, but I've, I've never seen it to where there just wasn't any on the branches. Um, but if you see rosettes forming at the ends, it could also be zinc deficiency. But I don't think that's what's going on here. <clears throat> All right. Let's look at the next one. Okay, so I've been going around trying to assess crop load. And what I have found is in most of our pecan producing regions, we have a very light crop this year. Um, and that's pictured right here. You see the nutlets are forming. And what I'm finding is they're forming about three per cluster um, at the farms that I have visited. And they're pretty spotty, but it's really hard to assess right now because the, the nutlets aren't big enough for, for me to see like up at the top of the trees. So it, it gets a little easier to assess crop load when the nuts are bigger. And um, now I, I talked to Keith, um, and, and Kevin Van Pelt and Kevin um, has growers in the Moralton area. Keith is in the Lone Oak area. And, you know, they were a little farther along in the development stage during the freeze event we had in April. So they were about at flower. And Keith reported that he had um, cut open some of the flowers and seen some damage. So I'm guessing we, we have some, some freeze injury there that's, that's gonna cause a lighter crop. Like I said, it's really hard to assess this until about this time where we see the nutlets actually forming and we won't know a whole lot until they, they progress and mature a little bit more. But you can see this is what we're seeing in our area, um, which is what you want to see. Um, we're having about seven um, nutlets um, per terminal. And there's a picture. Um, that looks like our crop is going to be mid um, to heavy in some of our trees here in Clarksville. And um, so it, it, looks, it looks a little bit better um, the farther north you go. 
and we were not at flower during the freeze. So made a big difference. Just a reminder that we have to protect pecans for a very long period of time and they're out there exposed for eight or nine months. And here's all of the, the critters we have to worry about. And then I always like to remind everybody at the beginning that scab is our number one threat to pecan quality. And this just shows you um, right here, the effect it has on kernel fill and then also nut sizing. And um, so just want to make sure that that I make that point. It's very important to spray for pecan scab in Arkansas. So a little bit about scouting. Um, I recommend scouting the fourth tree every fourth row. Um, depending on the size of your orchard, you might just be doing every fourth tree. And make sure you get some of the edge trees and some of the middle trees. They need to be scouted once a week. And it's good to sample 10 terminals and 10 compound leaves per tree. And we consider this a whole leaf. The leaves that make up the compound leaf, um, we refer to as leaflets. Of course, the number of trees you scout, um, the better. And remember to sample the different varieties because different varieties are more or less susceptible um, to some pests. So one thing we have to worry about in pecans all season long, um, is what causes this damage and that is the aphid and there's a couple of different aphid species that we have to worry about but if you see this yellowing or like necrotic tissue that runs in between the leaf veins um, it's likely aphids and if you see that on the top of the leaf then flip them over and you'll probably um, discover the creature so um, these aphids are generally yellow and um, black margined aphids are very common in pecan orchards and the winged form has um, black stripes um, on the, the leading edge of their wings. Yellow pecan aphid is also um, very common and then we have black pecan aphid. And black pecan aphid is the one we really worry about because black pecan aphid, when it feeds, injects a toxin into the leaf that causes defoliation. And if you have a severe black pecan aphid infestation, it can cause defoliation of an entire pecan tree in about three days. So pretty, pretty quickly. I don't see black aphids very often. Um, so it's, it's good that they're kind of rare, but you need to keep a lookout for them. And one thing is this is a, a close up picture um, of the bottom of a leaf is to know that there's different things on the bottom of that leaf related to aphids. And parasitized aphids sometimes are mistaken for black aphids, um, but the parasitized aphids, they're really going to be black. They're not going to be moving around. So just keep your eye out for those and know that those are parasitized. You also see aphid skins and they're white and they kind of look spider-like um, along with the, the live aphids. So damage that aphids cause. They can reduce nut quality. They can reduce flowers that will be produced for the next year. And they provide a food source for sooty mold. So what they excrete is very shiny on that leaf surface. So that's a really good way to see if you have aphids in pecan orchards too, is you'll start seeing that the leaves become shiny. Um, and then if you flip over and, and look at the underside, you'll, you'll find the aphids. Um, but that honeydew, that sticky coating on the leaves causes a mold to grow and it's black. So the leaf isn't able to um, photosynthesize as much as it should. 
and it can really affect um, nut quality because it takes you know a whole cluster of leaves to to mature those nuts and if they're not getting enough um, nutrition then they're not going to mature and those kernels aren't going to fill they can cause premature defoliation and that's especially with the black aphid so commercial control early season um, numbers have to be fairly high um, to treat because you don't want to knock down your natural enemies. Um, rain usually keeps them in check, and we've had a lot of rain this year, especially heavy rains. Um, what we say is after August 1st, if you have 10 to 15 aphids per compound leaf, and this is for yellow or black margin aphids, you need to treat. Black aphids is one to three per compound leaf. And you can do selective treatments with aphids. You'll probably notice that some varieties um, are more susceptible than others. Dormant oil applications, if you've had a history of aphid infestations, dormant oil applications can really help. Um, Aphids will overwinter in the tree bark, so this will help get rid of some of those um, overwintering aphids. Limit your sprays of pyrethroids early season um, so you can help build that population of natural enemies. Um, that'll help increase the, parasit the, the, um, the ones that are going to be parasitized by the parasitic wasp. We want lots of those guys flying around. Insecticides that are used the most are imidacloprid products. There has been some resistance reported in areas, so keep your eye out for that if you notice that it's not working as well as it, it used to. Um, we need to know and, and try to get those tested for resistance. Closer-centric pyrethroids also work. Um, you can pay anywhere from $5 to $30 per acre. You know, Transform is a product that works well, but it's going to be way up there on that $20, $30 range compared to some of your cheaper products. Like a midacloprid um, is probably somewhere there in the $7, $8 range, and then your pyrethroids are down there lower. <clears throat> So all season, we need to be concerned with mites. Some of the, the things you wanna look for is rolling around the leaf edges. And you can see in this picture, just overall bronzing and yellowing of the leaves. And this is pecan leaf scorch mite. And you can see defoliation um, starting at the tops of these trees. And um, so you wanna keep your eyes out for that. Um, pecan leaf scorch mite is pretty small. So, if you take samples, um, you can send them to Sherry Smith, or also you probably have to bring them in and look at, uh, look at them under the microscope. They're really hard to see with a hand lens. Now, if it's just two spotted spider mite, they can also be an issue. Those you can see with a hand lens um, pretty easy. So mid to late season, fall webworm um, can be an issue. Um, Generally, we don't treat for fall webworm and mature trees because they're just not going to cause very much damage. But I, I have seen one year where I recommended treatment, and that was because we were getting about 30 to 40 percent of the foliage um, encased in fall webworm. And, you know, if you're getting above 25 percent of the tree foliage um, consumed by fall webworm, you know, then you're probably going to want to try to do something. Um, but they're so protected in these, these webs, it only works if they're in the first or second instars. So hickory shuckworm, I mentioned that earlier, that they make a trap for monitoring. Another way you can tell that you have hickory shuckworm is in July, pecans have a natural drop. And if you look at those um, and you, you evaluate those, sometimes you can find hickory shuckworm eggs. And right here is a hickory shuckworm egg. It's, it's light, 
white and it's an egg that the moth will actually brush off scales from its back and its wings to cover the egg. Um, so they're, they're really noticeable on the nuts. Hickory shuckworms can cause drop. So um, they'll come in and they'll, the larvae will hatch and, and eat within the shuck. They don't get into the kernel like pecan nut case bear. That's how you can tell them apart. And they mainly just feed in between the kernel and the shuck and they cause a lot of damage, premature drop, stick tights where they don't shed, um, things like that. Here's a picture of the adult, the larvae, and they'll pupate in that um, shuck. So that's another reason why it's important to remove all of our old debris, pecans, shucks off the ground, because a lot of um, insects will um, pupate in them and you can increase your population over time if they're not removed. Here's a picture of a pupa skin and an old shuck. A picture of the damage. When you have shuck worm, what you'll notice is usually black, very large areas of black. And um, whereas, you know, pecan scab can look very similar, but if you just take a knife or some pruners and cut into this, um, you'll find the larvae or the pupae pretty easily. So control is, you know, they make rakes to rake the orchards and have a good cleanup program. Look at aborted nuts during your summer drop for larvae. Um, controlling phylloxera, and we talked about phylloxera um, as an early season pest because hickory shuckworm will feed on phylloxera galls. Half shell hardening is the premier time to treat for hickory shuckworm. And this is about the same time um, we have weevil emergence. So often if you're treating for weevil, um, it will pick up on hickory shuckworm, but every once in a while they emerge early and you'll miss the first generation with your weevil applications. So it is important to monitor for this one. Um, I really like Confirm, Intrepid um, for this. You know, Intrepid is methoxyphenazide. There's a generic too, um, and it has a long residual and it's really soft on beneficials. After your first treatment, um, you may need a second treatment if you use like a pyrethroid um, or a BT product that has um, less of a residual. I see this a lot. This is walnut caterpillar. Um, this is what the eggs look like. And they'll start laying their eggs about, oh, in a few weeks. Um, I haven't seen any eggs yet in the field, but they're just on the, a mass of eggs um, on the underside of the leaves. And walnut caterpillar will, will completely consume um, all of the leaves. So you just have petioles sticking out everywhere. And um, they're really detrimental to smaller trees. Um, and same recommendation for them as hickory shuckworm. 